think those of you who are here. Um, that was a reminder, these meetings are recorded. And so you will be able to watch it afterwards. And if you've missed anything or if your friend couldn't make it, you're welcome to share the information with them as well. Welcome. Um, we are happy to welcome you to Georgetown Village's um, CCC program this evening. We are particularly pleased you are joining us. A few logistics before the, we start the program. We ask that you remain muted until after the talk, at which point we will ask for questions. If you have a question, you are welcome to raise your hand, um, either physically or electronically, and I'll be happy to call on you. If you'd prefer not to ask the question yourself, you feel free to put it in the chat box and I will be happy to read it for you. As you know, this evening we have Stephen Roberts joining us. Uh, he has been a journalist for more than 50 years covering some of the major events of our time from the anti-war movement and student revolts of the 60s and 70s to President Reagan's historic trip to Moscow in 1988 and 13 presidential election campaigns, a lot of campaigns. After graduating from Harvard magna cum laude in 1964, Stephen joined the New York Times as a research assistant to James Weston. He was then the paper's Washington bureau chief. Stephen's 25 year career with the Times included assignments as bureau chief in Los Angeles and Athens, as well as a congressional and White House correspondent. He was a senior writer at the US News for seven years, specializing in national politics and foreign policy. Since 1997, Stephen has been the Shapiro Professor of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University, where he has taught for the last 30 years. One of the nice things that Stephen shared with me earlier is that he likes keeping in touch with his students and he's been able to see many of them during these talks. Stephen has many awards, including the Dirksen Award for covering Congress, the Wilbur Award for reporting on religion and politics, and the Bender Prize as one of GW's top undergraduate teachers and has six honorary degrees. Stephen is a practicing journalist and author, and he serves as the chief political analyst for ABC Radio. In addition, he writes a national syndicated newspaper column. Stephen has written eight books, two of them co-authored with his late wife, the noted journalist, Pokey Roberts. In February of 2000, Stephen Pokey published From This Day Forward, an account of their marriage, as well as other marriages in American history. In 2009, he published From Every End of the Earth, the story of 13 immigrant families and the new lives they've made in America. In addition to that, Stephen Pogge had two children, Lee, a banker in Raleigh, North Carolina, and Rebecca, a museum specialist who we had the privilege of having at one of our CCC programs earlier this year. Um, Rebecca is also a museum specialist and book author. In addition, Steve has six grandchildren, and in his spare time, though I don't know where he's found any, he plays tennis and roots for his grandchildren's sports team. We are very excited to have Stephen Roberts joining us for our last Cocktails Conversation and Community Program of the Year. Although this year was very difficult in some ways, in others there have been some many bright spots, including our CCC programs. We have had an outstanding array of speakers, including Stephen's daughter, Rebecca, who introduced us to Planet Word. We hope that those of you from our community who are joining us have enjoyed these programs as well, and you will help to support us and the program. We ask for your support in order to continue to provide these free quality programs to the community. Please consider making a donation to Georgetown Village by clicking on the link we have placed in the chat box. Again, we will ask you to remain muted during the talk today, and that at all times, if you have a question at the end, we will be happy to recognize you and ask to hear your question. At this point, without any further ado, I welcome Stephen Roberts. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, of course, the occasion for doing this talk is a new book that I uh, published this fall um, called Cokie, A Life Well Lived. And um, this is really a combination of a memoir and uh, uh, biography of Cokie. But, um, uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of the village concept as Cokie always was. And um, 
couple of years ago, I got um, I was getting new knees, and of course, as many of you have been through any kind of procedure like that, uh, some kind of social worker comes to the house and she checks the uh, uh, the railings on the stairs and whether you're going to slip and fall. And so, she found one of the railings coming up to our second floor uh, kind of shaky, and so she said to me, "Well, if you decide to age in place, you should get this fixed." And I looked at her and I said what the hell do you think I've been doing for the last 40 years, except aging in place? I live in the same house that Koki and I um, moved into in 1977. I still live I'm in this house tonight. Um, and uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, Koki and I were such strong supporters of the village concept and, and, and felt a so strong tie to this whole community here. Um, because as some of you know, uh, her parents bought this house I live in on Bradley Boulevard in 1952, um, I came to this house the first time when I was 20 years old. Uh, we were married in the yard in 1966. I can point right through the window to the left and uh, look at the place, uh, the exact place where we were married in 1966. And in fact, we had our 50th wedding anniversary exactly 50 years to the day after our marriage in the exact same spot we were married. Uh, so. Uh, our roots in this community are quite deep and my affection for this community is very strong. And so um, I, I deeply believe in the village concept and the ability of, of people to stay in their homes and their communities and, and nurture each other and help each other. It's uh, something that um, I think is a wonderful concept and uh, I'm happy to be with you tonight. Um, and um, you know, I, I'll tell you the story about how I first came to this area. Um, Koki and I met at a student political meeting uh, in the summer of 1963, 62. Um, it was between our junior and uh, junior and sophomore years in college, and uh, we were at a student political meeting in um, uh, in uh, Ohio State University. She was a delegate from Wellesley. I was a delegate from Harvard, and uh, I had met her sister Barbara uh, at a previous meeting, and she had met my twin brother Mark at a previous meeting. So, the way she always told the story, she would. She was looking across the room and saw someone who looked a lot like Mark Roberts, but it wasn't quite Mark Roberts. So she comes over and uh, she looks at my name tag and says, are you Mark Roberts' brother? And I look at her name tag and I said, are you Barbara Boggs' sister? And that's, that's how we met. I was 19 years old. She was 18. Um, and as uh, luck would have it that fall, our dorms back in Boston were only 12 and a half miles apart. And um, so we actually went out a couple of times that fall, but I was a typical guy, I stopped calling. I mean, I was, I was only 19. I, I just didn't have any idea of what it was like to have a serious girlfriend. I'd never had one before. Uh, and, um, but also hanging over the, uh, our relationship was the fact that um, we had, we were very different religious traditions. Uh, I grew up in a, a very Jewish household in Bayonne, New Jersey. She was uh, a very devout Catholic. Uh, look, her mother eventually became the ambassador of the Vatican. So this was not a casual connection in the Box family. And so we kind of assumed that this was an impediment that we could never overcome. And so, as I say, I stopped calling. But fortunately, I had some friends who would go to Wellesley regularly. They'd come back and say, oh, I saw Koki Box and she said hello. And that spring, spring of 1963, uh, again, we were supposed to come to Washington for a student political meeting, and I was going to cover it for the Harvard Crimson. I was a reporter covering po politics, student politics for the Crimson. And uh, it happened that we were had arranged to come uh, drive here to Washington in the same car. Now, I had not seen Koki in months. And uh, for those of you who know Cambridge, Massachusetts, the car was parked on Mount Auburn Street. Um, and uh, I approached the car to uh, join this group of students to come down to Washington. And I saw Koki through the back window. And I said to myself, you idiot, <laughs> this is the girl, what have you been doing? And we drove down here together and we really have, we're together from that weekend. I mean, that was, um, but it was, it was difficult because the first thing that happened that weekend was that I had a cough, a terrible cough. I was spending the winter in Boston. Anybody who spends the winter in Boston has a cough. And um, I was ensconced in Koki's girlhood room. We were staying, I was staying here at the house. And um, 
I was ensconced in her girlhood room. And that first night, this is the first night I spent in this house that I now lived in for 44 years. And I figured it wasn't Koki. I hear a knock on the door and I figured it's not Koki. It's 1963. Girls didn't do things like that in 1963, at least not in my experience. And so in Wasp, my future mother-in-law, the future member of Congress, 18 years member of Congress, future ambassador to the Vatican, Lindy Boggs, in an off the shoulder pink negligee and says to me, darling, you sound terrible. Drink this. I, I was in shock. I'd never met anybody like this in Bayonne, New Jersey. I can tell you that. And at that point, yes, ma'am, whatever you say, I'm sure it was at least two thirds bourbon. And the joke in the family was that I fell in love with my mother-in-law first and eventually got around to Koki. And there is some significant truth to that. But the next night, there were a whole, um, as I say, there was a whole group of us were supposed to stay at this house. And one by one, all the other boys dropped out. So I was the only one here. And there was another fellow who was angling to take Koki home, who was very smitten with Koki. And um, he was angling to take her home. But I was staying here, so I had the inside track. So we, we came back together late that night after the student political meeting, and we stayed up all night talking in a room that's directly below the room I'm sitting in right now. And that was the moment when we started to see a path forward. We started to see that all of the prejudices and stereotypes and assumptions people had made about us were not necessarily true. And that we started to realize we shared so much more than we didn't, that even though we came from different faith traditions, we shared a value system and we shared uh, a sense of rootedness, a sense of deep obligations and, and reverence for our own, our own traditions. And even though they were different traditions, the, the concept of, of caring and, and being loyal to family and to history was very powerful for both of us. And uh, we were together ever since. And that's why our wedding rings were inscribed forever spring because that was the spring we fell in love. And that was 1963. Uh, but four more years, it took four more years, really, for us to convince our parents that, and a lot of other people were trying to tell us this could never work. I got a letter from my father, and I revered, to this day, I revere my father. Um, he was my first editor. More than anybody else, he was the reason I became a writer. And he wrote me a single-spaced, five-page letter saying, that this could never work. And that uh, if you become, if you marry this Catholic woman, you will be a stranger in your own household. I only realized many years later after reading letters, and I wrote a memoir some years later and I read some letters my dad and mom had exchanged. And I, I finally realized what my dad was really saying was he would be a stranger in the household, not me. But you can imagine, the combination of Koki Boggs and Lindy Boggs putting on a charm offensive uh, uh, with my father as the target. And they and he didn't have a chance. I mean, when these two women ganged up on him and they were so devoted to him and so uh, eager to convince him that this could really work. My father finally said to me at one point, you know, Stephen, it would be so much easier to oppose this marriage if it wasn't so obvious, she's the perfect girl for you. And once he said that, I knew it was gonna be all right. And in the end, Koki um, joyfully embraced my Jewish heritage um, to the point where uh, she was uh, known as the best Jew in the family. Now, she always pointed out, there was not a lot of competition for the title in my family. <laughs> it was a pretty low bar, but, um, she joyfully embraced uh, the tradition. And one of the ways she did that was not only did she insist that we have Passover seders, which I did not grow up with. I was very much a product of a Jewish family, but a Jewish family that identified with its tribal roots, not with religious practice. And so it was, my mother often said that the first seder she ever went to was organized by her Catholic daughter-in-law. Um, and in fact, Koki wound up writing a Haggadah 
which we used uh, in the family for many years um, and which eventually was published as a book. Uh, and I venture to say, I think I can say this without fear of contradiction, that Koki Roberts was the only daughter of an ambassador to the Vatican who was co-author of a Passover Haggadah. I think I can say without any fear of contradiction that, 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 that she was unique in, in that way. Not only that, she eventually was made a life member of Hadassah. And she was such, so popular in Jewish uh, communities and spoke all over the country at Jewish events that she was made a life member by the um, uh, Hadassah chapter in Boca Raton, Florida. Koki always pointed out, she said, the year they made me a life member, there was a sale on life memberships and they got it cheap, but that's okay. Um, she still was very honored by the, uh, by the uh, designation. And that's, um, you know, and, and that's a question a lot of people ask about us and, and, and what I write about in the book is how did you, um, uh, how did you get past the, the prejudices and the uh, stereotypes that so many people try to impose on us? And it took a long time. I've tried to pass this on to my students and my young friends and having taught college for 30 years, I've got a great many uh, young people who have sought my counsel and uh, on these matters. And I, I say the important thing is to look at, not look at the labels and not look at the stereotypes and not look at the assumptions other people have. Look inside each other, look to what you really believe. The truth is you sit around the kitchen table, you don't, debate theology, for goodness sake. What you sit around, when you sit around the kitchen table, you talk about how are we gonna raise the kids and what values matter and, and, and what priorities are gonna animate and, and, and guide our family together. And once we got past the, those prejudices, we found that we shared a great deal. But it was also, we were creatures of our time. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in this book is the fact that Koki faced enormous prejudices when she first set out as a woman, young woman, uh, in this business. Uh, it was a, a sign of what life was like in 1966 that when we got married, um, we didn't even have a conversation about whose job was more important. And Koki, a lot of people don't realize this, but Koki was already running her own TV show here in Washington on the local NBC station. It was on on Sunday morning. It was actually the lead-in to Meet the Press. It was called Meeting of the Minds. She was the host of the show. Um, and yet we never had a conversation. I was working on in New York on the city staff of the New York Times and she moved to get married. She moved to New York. She starts looking for a job. And it was a, um, uh, it was a uh, sign of, of, of what life was like then that um, doors were just slammed in her face. Now, this is a woman, let's remember, this is a woman who eventually wrote five national best-selling books, five of them. And she was told over and over again, flat out, we do not hire women to be writers. But that was, that was life in 1966, 1967 for women, young women. And Koki became a, very devoted feminist on many levels, in part not because she read Betty, Betty Friedan or because she, you know, she, uh, it's because she lived the life that so many other women were living. And she herself wrote about how feminism came from the bottom up for so many of these women of, that, of her age. They, it came from these repeated rejections, these repeated this re discrimination, the, the repeated um, uh, denigration of, of their skills and their uh, abilities. And um, she became a very deeply committed feminist who in her entire life, um, there's a bright arc that runs through this book and the many stories I tell in this book, a bright arc um, of almost whatever, almost everything she did in her life was motivated by helping, supporting, encouraging, promoting, the role of women, and and that's the the central theme that runs through, that runs through this book, and um, as I say, it came from experience. It came from those doors being slammed in her face, but it also came from the experience of how important women um, 
as friends and women as mentors were in, in her life. One of the, particularly for an audience here in Washington to remember was that she went to a school called Stone Ridge, which is right out, many of you know where it is. It's right outside of downtown Bethesda going north on, on Rockville Pike, right next to uh, Bethesda, what used to be called Bethesda Naval. And this was a school run by an order of nuns called the Sacred Heart Nuns. And uh, Koki often said that this was uh, these women religious who taught her. And she dedicated one of her books to the Sacred Heart Order. And she said, the, the nuns took women seriously in the 19, took girls seriously in the 1950s, which was not common. And um, uh, it left her with a deep lifelong loyalty to uh, nuns in general and the Sacred Heart Order in particular. And uh, she was uh, very open about this. And uh, uh, she uh, and, and shared to some extent the, not only the inspiration of the nuns who taught her, but to some extent the bitterness that they felt about being second-class citizens in the Catholic Church. As she used to say, the nuns always told us we could grow up to be anything we wanted except priests. And it was something that, um, and she was asked many times, particularly by Catholic uh, journals and newspapers, interviewers, if you could change one thing in the Catholic Church, what would you change? And she always said the same thing, ordain women. And, uh, but she was deeply devoted to the church, even so, even in the face of all of the sexism and, and, and uh, uh, efforts to uh, make it difficult to be a thinking woman in the Catholic Church. In fact, she was once asked, well, what's your favorite Sunday morning news program? And her answer was mass. <laughs> so um, she was she was very devoted to the order and running through this book is the effect of her religious faith uh, on so many of the choices and priorities that she made. And one of the ways this worked was that if a nun asked her to do something, she tried to do it if she possibly could. And um, uh, at one point she had a, a dear friend who's um, still a friend of mine named Joan Magnetti, sister Joan. Uh, who's a Sacred Heart nun, and she runs a uh, school for girls in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. And at one point, Joni, as Koki used to call her, Joni calls and says, Koki, I got to be uh, candid with you. I need a favor. Because Mother Teresa has agreed to be the graduation speaker at our school. But I've also been warned that she's notoriously unreliable and that she could cancel at any time. And so I want you to put this on your calendar in case we need you to pinch hit. Right? Joni, fine, whatever you want, I'll do. Two weeks before the graduation, Mother Teresa canceled. She had fallen, she hurt herself in Rome, she cancels. Joni calls in her chick. And as she tells me the story, uh, the girls are all sitting on the lawn of the, you know, it's graduations, the girls are sitting on the lawn of the school and it's a beautiful spring day. And uh, as Joni describes the scene, Koki comes out in a bright yellow orange dress with a big hat, looking gorgeous. And she throws her arms out and says to the crowd, clearly, I am not Mother Teresa. <laughs> and um, uh, she was not Mother Teresa. Uh, and she'd be the first to say she wasn't a saint either. But she was deeply devoted to the, um, to the order and to, and to her faith. And when you think about all the things she did and the, and the influences on her, um, this was profound. Uh, and she would not be the person she was without um, the powerful uh, underpinning of, of her faith. And it was one of the, the and, and I did my best uh, in our years together uh, to match her uh, joyful embrace of my traditions to understand hers. Um, you know, I, um, uh, there were limits to what I could do, but I can tell you on Christmas Eve for many, many years, it's still true, I still do it. Um, they let the Jewish guy read the Old Testament lesson at Christmas, Christmas Eve mass at Stone Ridge School, um, just as a sign of my respect and, and, and my, um, uh, my um, uh, attempts to 
I couldn't match. I, no one was going to call me the best Catholic in the family, but um, I tried to match her, her, her devotion to, uh, to her faith. Um, and there was another uh, influence that um, those of you living and working here in Washington, um, I think would particularly appreciate. When you think about uh, how did it happen that she was such so devoted to women um, in, uh, in history, you know, she wrote five books celebrating the role of women in history. Um, and one of the reasons was because she grew up here in Washington with her own mother, Lindy Boggs, uh, deeply involved in uh, the work of her father. As many of you know, her father, Hale Boggs, had been a member of Congress for 30 years. And um, he was killed in a plane crash in 1972. Um, and uh, Lindy had always been his um, chief advisor, uh, his chief um, counselor. Uh, and Koki grew up seeing not only her mother, but seeing her mother's friends, Lady Bird Johnson, Pauline Gore, Betty Ford, and that whole generation of women who of enormous talent and enormous abilities who defined themselves in terms of their husbands and who were absolutely essential in the ability of their famous husbands to be successful as politicians. And so, you know, Koki said, I, I understood Abigail Adams and I understood Dolly Madison and I understood so many of the women I wrote about uh, because I'd seen it, I had lived with it. I had grown up seeing the modern versions of these women. And uh, at one point uh, after Koki's dad was killed in this plane crash, um, uh, her mother decided to run for his seat in Congress. And so she called her lifelong friend, Lady Bird Johnson, and said, uh, Bird, uh, before you read about the papers, I want you to know I'm going to run for Hale C. And, and Mrs. Johnson said, why, Lindy, darling, that's, that's wonderful news, but how are you going to do it without a wife? And it's one of my favorite political stories, because um, both Lindy Boggs and Lady Bird Johnson understood um, each other very well, and they understood the roles that both of them had played. Um, but um, uh, this was an important uh, uh, explanation, an important motivation for how Koki um, uh, started writing books about history. And it was the life she lived growing up right here in our neighborhood, in our community um, that we all share here, uh, that um, we didn't have villages back then, but if they did, um, these women would have been running them too. I mean, these were women who ran everything in Washington. Um, with, of course, the invaluable help of the Black women who uh, were native to the city. So um, uh, her whole life and her career is rooted um, in the experiences she had here in Washington as a, as, a, as a child growing up. Her parents, as I say, brought this out in 1952 when she was eight. Uh, and um, this is very much a part of who, who she became. Uh, and, um, but there's a whole part of this book that's not about the public Koki at all. Um, it's pretty well known that she was for two generations, 40 years, this powerful, important, potent figure uh, on the national scene. And for countless, I mean, I heard these stories over and over again for countless young women who told me that some version of the same story, which is, I wanted to be like Koki. I could watch television and I could say, I can be that smart. I can be that strong. I can be myself. I don't have to hide who I am. I don't have to hide how smart I am. And this was an enormously important contribution. Um, a TV producer who helped put Koki on, the, on, uh, on TV for the early in her career talked about um, when Koki started working for ABC and people started noticing her at ABC and started tuning into ABC. And over and over again, this, this woman, Linda Winslow said to me, I would hear from other women who said, I'm now watching ABC because of Koki and I'm watching because she asks the questions I want asked and she says the things I'm thinking. And she is speaking from life experience that we share together as women. Sure, there were plenty of men who thought she was really smart and really sexy, but the core of her uh, most devoted followers were other women 
who saw not only that she was an inspiration to them and to their daughters, but that she spoke, she was this rare person on TV who understood them and spoke from their perspective and, and, and knew what their lives had been like. Because before her, there weren't that many women and frankly, certainly not many women who had shared her life, meaning she had a long marriage, she had six, two kids, six grandkids. And, and, she, and she was very strong in making sure people understood this about her. She wanted people to understand what her value system was. The first day she ever worked for ABC, which was in 1987, producer who was there that day, she was doing Sunday morning show um, for the first time. And she was just there as an audition. They hadn't hired her or anything. It was a one-off audition. Uh, and she walks in and says to this producer, Mark, there are three things you need to know about me. I've been married to the same man for 20 years. I live in the house I grew up in and I go to church every Sunday. And if you understand those three things about me, we're gonna get along fine. And that was Cokie Roberts, those three. And then Mark said to me, Steve, you know, all the, all the years I then knew you both, the only thing that changed in that story was the number of years you were married. Otherwise, it was always, it was always the same story. And that's who she was. And that's one of the, was in many ways, the core of um, uh, the loyalty that people had to her. I talked to one woman, her name is Amnon Nawaz. Some of you know that name. She's now on the news hour with uh, uh, sort of Judy Woodruff's main substitute host on the news, on the news hour. And Amna um, uh, was talking about the fact that she was a child of uh, immigrants from Pakistan. And as a child growing up, her parents gave her one of Koki's books and said, this is the woman you should emulate. This is who you should be. You should try to be Koki Roberts. And, and I heard countless stories. Like that. But there's another side to Koki that I write about in this book that I think is just as important and in some ways even more important. And that's the private Koki. And this is a woman who lived the gospel. I mentioned how strongly the nuns had influenced her, but this was not just an intellectual uh, ideal or, or, or model. It was a day-to-day -day creed for living your life. And this is a woman who did something good for somebody else every single day of her life. Personal favor, she, would, she went to every maternity ward in the greater Washington area, a young friend of hers had a baby when friends were facing diagnosis of serious illness, particularly breast cancer. She was always there with them at, um, with them at, uh, uh, at the doctor's visit. She knew she had nursed her sister through a final illness uh, with cancer. She knew how important it was to have somebody with you in those moments that are so terrifying and so traumatic, who can ask questions of doctors and, and can listen to the answers. Her friend, Linda Winslow, the woman who uh, I just quoted about uh, how more and more women are watching ABC. Linda faced a very serious operation for ovarian cancer at one point. And she didn't have a, a family here. She, all of her family was out of state. Koki spent almost the entire day just sitting outside in the waiting room at, I think it was at Sibley Hospital, waiting for this lengthy operation to finish. And Linda told me the story that um, her doctor having completed the operation, goes to talk to the family in the waiting room and is stunned to find that who he's talking to is Cokie Roberts, who is peppering him with questions because Cokie actually thought she deserved a degree in oncology. I think that's probably overestimating her expertise. She actually also thought she deserved several other degrees, orthopedics uh, and, and uh, uh, various other pediatrics, certainly, but oncology was her specialty, unfortunately, because she had lived through this with her sister and so many other friends. And so this doctor is shell-shocked that Cokie Roberts is bombarding him with all these questions. He comes back into Cokie's friend Linda's hospital room and says, Linda, I've just been questioned by Cokie Roberts. He said, I felt like I was on Meet the Press. Um, and Linda said, I didn't bother to tell him he had the wrong network, that she was not on NBC, she was on ABC, but apart from that. Um, and, and that's the other side of Cokie. She, 
these stories of private generosity of spirit and, and, and concern for other people, um, overwhelming. I, I heard stories I had never heard. I was married to her for 53 years. I knew a lot about her, but I wasn't there at those hospital rooms. I wasn't there when she went to the funerals of her friend's parents. I was not there when legions of young women literally lined up outside her offices at NPR and ABC count, seeking counsel and, and, and encouragement. And so I spent a lot of time on this book talking to her female friends and hearing stories I had never heard before. I'll tell you a couple. One that I um, um, was um, told to me by her great friend, Nina Totenberg. Um, and uh, Nina uh, tells the story about, Nina was married to a man who was much older than she was. He was 26 years older. And um, she knew the odds were that at some point she was going to be burying her husband. But when he finally did die, she was just bereft. And, and, and she said, Cokie ran Floyd's death. Um, Cokie arranged for everything. The, 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 uh, the services, he, he was a decorated military veteran and it was Cokie who got permission, which was not easy to get him buried at Arlington. And th these are Na Nina's words. He, she managed Floyd's death. And then it came down to picking out a casket. And so Cokie says, well, I'll go with you. Now imagine this, what kind of friendship it takes to go with someone to pick out a casket for your husband. So they go to Galder's funeral home. Unfortunately, a place all of us have spent too much time in. And so this, and Nina's telling this rather obsequious young man is trying to sell them a more expensive casket. And uh, then Nina really wanted to spend. And so he says to the Thompson, a uh, Ms. Totenberg, your husband was a very tall man. And so I think he'd be much more comfortable in this more expensive cancer. Koki and Nina catch each other's eyes and burst out laughing. Now, not only was this incredible gesture of friendship to go with Nina, but then what kind of friend will laugh with you over your husband's casket? This is a level of friendship, a level of loyalty, a level of devotion that we all need in our lives, you know? And when we get it, when we have a friend like that, it's, it's a lifelong blessing. And everybody on this call knows what I mean about, particularly at those moments of, of, of greatest stress and greatest trauma, um, to, have, um, uh, to have somebody there. And, but Koki was also there for happy moments. She was, she loved babies. If there was, if there was a baby in the zip code, Koki would find it. And one young friend tells me the story about Koki showing up. There's a young producer at ABC. Koki showing up at the maternity ward. This child, this young woman, had just had twins, and Koki scoops up one of the babies, um, uh, uh, and uh, starts um, making a sign of the cross on this baby's forehead. And this woman says, Koki, you know this is a Jewish child. And Koki says, of course I know, Alana, it's a Jewish child. I'm just covering our bases. You don't mind if I baptize him. <laughs> and so I said, no, go ahead, Koki. We'll, you know, we'll cover all our bases here. But another young woman named Karen Travers, a producer, uh, now a, a prominent reporter on ABC, tells the story. She had twins. And um, uh, they had a neighborhood listserv because Karen was, the, the babies were premature. It was a difficult birth. And Karen was really... Um, uh, laid low by this. And so the neighborhood, her neighborhood over in Virginia, uh, people signed up to bring them food uh, uh, for a couple of weeks. And her neighbors come up to her and said, Karen, is that the Cokie Roberts who signed up to bring you dinner on Thursday night? And Karen said, oh yeah, she's a friend of mine. And Karen tells the story to Cokie. She didn't go out to Wegmans and buy something. She went and she made one of her favorite New Orleans recipes. Cookie was a wonderful cook and she uh, particularly loved cooking New Orleans recipes. And so she made gumbo or red beans, I don't know, I think it was red beans. And she leaves this big pot of this stuff on 
Karen's doorstep, along with two bottles of wine and saying, Karen, I think you're actually going to need the wine even more than you, <laughs> you're going to need the food. Um, and I heard, heard so many stories, so many stories like that. And in the end, when I decided as I read, as I heard all of these stories and, and wrote this book over the last two years, that I came to this understanding that not everybody can be a TV star like Cokie. Not everybody can be on television or on radio. Not everybody can be this public role model for other women. Everybody can be a good person. Everybody can be a good friend. Everybody can learn something about her, the private Cokie. And that's what I hope people learn from the book. And I've had so many friends say in one form or another, I now ask myself, what would Koki do? One of her childhood friends says, I don't want a bracelet that says WWJD, what would Jesus do? I want a bracelet that says WWCD, what would Koki do? And the truth is, I live that way too. And I'll tell you the final story in the book and I'll get to your questions. While I was writing this book, a year ago, September, um, my younger brother, Glenn died. Glenn, very much part of this community, lived his whole married life in uh, Garrett Park, uh, out, right outside of Bethesda, Maryland. And um, I knew he was fading. He had been suffering from Parkinson's for many years. Um, his wife had called me uh, the day before to say, if you want to see him one last time, you should get here today. I did. And the phone rang at six o'clock the next morning. And it's never good news at six o'clock in the morning, as we all know. And I, I knew instinctively what the call must be. And it was my sister-in-law saying, we lost him overnight. Um, and now you can go back to bed. I sat there with my phone in my hand. And I literally said to myself, what would Koki do? I didn't go back to bed. I got up, got dressed, headed for my brother's house. I called my sister, who knew of our brother's death. I knew that she had heard. And I said, Laura, I'm headed to Glenn's house because this is what Koki would want me to do. And this is what Koki would do. And she said, Stephen, you have it wrong. I said, what are you talking about, Laura? She said, Koki would have been sleeping on Glenn's couch last night. Later in the day, I talked to my son lives in North Carolina. And um, I tell him the story. He said, Dad, you're both wrong. Mom would have been on the couch for the last three nights sleeping in Clinton. And that's, in the end, the most important message of the book. Anybody can do that. Anybody can be a good person. Anybody can live a life that does so much good for other people. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has and fire away. Well, thank you so much. I think you're gonna to need to give us a minute to kind of think about that and welcome it and really embrace it. So thank you very much. That was really powerful. Um, I know that we've had some hands raised while you were speaking. So let me go to Janet whose hand was up earlier. Um, Janet, did you still have a question, a comment? And if so, please unmute. That's Janet Kegg. There you go. I was just curious as to whether your family included pets of any kind and what role did they play in your life? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the whole thing. Uh, what, what she asked, I can help you. What she asked was if your family um, had pets and what uh, role the pets played in your life? Pets. pets. Oh my goodness. Rose, where are you? <laughs> Here she is. All right. You want to know what the role pets play in my life? <laughs> there is Rose, the chocolate lab right here. Right, Rosie? Say hello to everybody. There you go, girl. <laughs> um, so um, pets have been enormously important in our uh, lives together. Koki and I always had had dogs, um, always devoted to them. Uh, and I have to say that um, one of the tragic ironies uh, was that our dearly beloved chocolate lab died the day before Koki did. 
Right. And um, my niece who lives here in Washington had our, our, our dog, Ella, had, it was, had a litter mate and twin sister who lived with my niece and they're identical, chocolate lab. And uh, so I said to my niece, Elizabeth, you have got to lend me your dog. And so for the first couple of weeks after Koki's death, living in this big house all by myself, um, I imported Ivy, uh, my niece's dog. And then my niece, I'm happy to say, to whom I'm deeply devoted, appointed herself head of the committee to find me a new dog. And I said, I want a female chocolate lab between three and four. And that's what she found me. And so uh, Rose is here. And I can tell you, as much as we, Koki and I loved having dogs together, um, having a dog in this big empty house is, it's uh, invaluable. Absolutely, as a dog owner, I totally agree. Can't live without them. Um, I have a comment in our chat box that somebody, uh, Arlene wrote just a comment about what a wonderful tribute you've written. And certainly we hear that in your presentation as well. It really is a beautiful tribute. And so thank you for sharing it. Are there any other questions? You please either raise your hand electronically or physically, and I will um, look to recognize you. Gail, so Gail, thank you. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Um, and while you're unmuting, I wanna thank you for making the arrangements for today's talk. So uh, Gail, you're muted. I'm gonna click the ask to unmute button. There you go. <laughs> Um, Steve, I just wanted to add my thanks, uh, especially for today, but also uh, there are a lot of Hill and Dale residents who are on this call, and I know many of them remember when Koki came and spoke to us, I don't know how many years ago, about one of her books. And of course, as, as Lynn said earlier, Rebecca spoke recently. It's, it's a fabulous family tradition, and so you know how much I appreciate you. And, also love cooking and so just many thanks. Well, thank, thank you. you. Gail. As many of you know, Gail and Gary have been uh, uh, friends of our families for many, many, many years. Um, and I, I certainly appreciate that, Gail. And, and you more than most would understand what I was talking about in terms of the, um, uh, not only the, the Cokie's devotion to uh, the family and those traditions, but also the way she embraced Judaism. Um, and, uh, you know, you and I have talked about this before, that um, uh, this was this extraordinary generosity of spirit um, that, uh, and, you know, it's, it's it, when I reflect back on this, because I came from a Jewish tradition that was tribal in terms of its loyalties, but not really in terms of Jewish ritual at all. And as you know, Gail, there are different strains here. There are different themes. So the, uh, uh, and, and, and you can be, feel very Jewish without ever going into a synagogue. And it's a, it's a historical, a cultural, a tribal loyalty, and often a political one. My grandparents, my grandfathers fled Eastern Europe largely for political reasons. Uh, they were both big lefties and, um, and they were even anti-religious. And so uh, being embraced by a tradition that not only cherished my identity, but also helped bring the family back to religious ritual was a, a, a deeply moving um, element of this whole journey we've been on. So, and I know you've been part of it. So thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, Tom, I see you. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Thank you. Um, I've been a great admirer of. Uh, hi, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> hi there. Good to see you. Anyway, um, a question for, for, for Steve Roberts. I really admire both your wife and your mother-in-law. I worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years. And so my question has to do with um, Toki coming from this intensely political family and then, you know, being a journalist and covering the scene um, the way that she did. Um, two sides of that. How did her family background and her experiences with... Uh, 
her father and her mother and her sister too, I, who was a politician in New Jersey, um, uh, in, inform her approach to her work and what uh, uh, occasions might there have been that she had to kind of step back uh, because there might be some conflict of interest. Um, good questions, Tom. Um, the fact is that uh, uh, Koki's connection to politics did not start with her parents. Uh, Koki's middle name was Claiborne, C-L-A-I-B-O-R-N-E. It was her mother's maiden name. Uh, the Claiborne's came to America in 1620. The first Claiborne elected to Congress was in 1797 from Tennessee. Um, there's a fellow named Steve Hess at the Brookings Institution who did a study uh, evaluating the prominence of different families in American political history by putting different numerical values on different uh, jobs people had had. And originally, he, the Claiborne's came in third in his rankings behind the Roosevelt's and the Kennedy's. Cokie, in very typical fashion, read his manuscript and said, Steve, you've forgotten about six members of my family. And he, she forced him to recalibrate uh, his rankings. And now the Claiborne's are rated second only behind the Roosevelt's and they had two, they had two presidents, so we couldn't keep up with them. So this was a very, very long sense of identification with public life and with politics. Uh, this is a woman who, her seventh birthday party was at the Capitol. When she was 12 years old, she was giving tours of the Capitol for her father's constituents. So um, it was, it, her commitment to public, um, uh, to public service and to public life was profound. And, uh, she grew up with this, you know, the Capitol, he always said the Capitol happened to be the place daddy worked. Um, when she was a small child, uh, Sam Rayburn, who was then the Speaker of the House, used to come out to this house for dinner almost every week. You know, she grew up with the Speaker of the House literally bouncing her on her knee when she was a small child. Um, so her, her commitment to, to public life was profound. And people asked, well, how did you become a journalist? And she basically said, I became a journalist because I married one. Uh, and that in another life, in another circumstance, she might well have run for office herself. But obviously she couldn't do that, Tom, as a, as a, as a wife of a journalist. And that's sort of how she wound up uh, becoming uh, more directed toward journalism. Um, uh, but she, um, she always said that journalism was a form of public service. And I agree with her about that. I think it was. Um, but in terms of conflicts with her mother, most of the time, um, uh, like, let's remember, both of us covered the Congress for eight years. Uh, I was the New York Times correspondent from 78 to 86 covering Congress. Koki was the correspondent for NPR. So we covered the same beats. We commuted together. We had lunch together. We covered the same stories. Um, and um, her mother was a member. Uh, and uh, most of the time, um, what her mother stood for was compatible with the way Koki um, approached her job. And one of the things that Koki, like her mother, um, were particularly devoted to issues related to women. And the, one of the stories I tell in the book, uh, because not only were there relatively few women in Congress, there were also relatively few women in the press corps in those early days. And so Koki tells the story of once um, there was a big budget uh, uh, meeting and all the negotiators uh, come out and all the reporters are clamoring to see what was in the budget. And it happened that that year, the big issue was something called the MX missile. And all the guys are saying, is the MX missile still in the budget? The MX missile? And Koki said, and I asked the question, is funding for mammograms still in the budget? And that typified the contribution she made as a woman. So in that sense, Lindy's priorities and Koki's priorities were compatible. Yes, there were times when uh, she couldn't quote her mother, when her mother was a, a prominent player um, in politics. And it was true for me too. Uh, and we often said that, you know, in some ways it was unfair to Lindy Boggs. She never appeared on public radio and she never appeared in the New York Times um, because we had a very strict rule. We knew that we were in the spotlight. We knew that pe people knew that we knew that they knew that she came from a democratic family. And so we were scrupulous in terms of making sure that uh, we stayed independent and impartial. And so there were, but that was on the edges. Um, that didn't happen very often, but it was something that we were very aware of, that we had to be ultra careful in being impartial because everybody knew, you know, her family background.
Steve, Steve I have a question. You, just one thing. It, it used to amuse me that Lindy Boggs and Claiborne Pell um, called each other cousin. Well, they were. <laughs> no. They were cousins. Because Claiborne uh, used to say family, uh, and uh, they were like fifth cousins. But the fact that they 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 were they were cousins, and um, uh, the uh, the Claiborne lineage is 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 very powerful. And uh, uh, the family got to New Orleans on a political deal. A uh, William. Uh, Charles Cole Claiborne, W.C.C. Claiborne was congressman from Tennessee, 1800, um, when the Jefferson Burr election was thrown into the House of Representatives. Claiborne had one whole vote himself. You would know, Tom, that, you know, in, if an election is thrown into the House, that's the rule, right? The, each state gets one vote. You could be California with 40 members. You could be of Wyoming with one. Every state got one vote. At the time, Tennessee only had one congressman. They'd only become a state four years before. Um, so Claiborne uh, carefully uh, bides his time, throws his support to Jefferson at a key moment. The next year, 1801, Jefferson names Claiborne the governor of Mississippi territory. Two years later, Jefferson buys Louisiana and names W.C.C. Claiborne the governor of Louisiana. That's how the family got to Louisiana <laughs> on a political deal. You know? how's, how strange is that? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> That's great, Steve. Thank you for sharing. Um, Stephen, I think, uh, Benita, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I have a, yes, I have a question now about the next generation. What about the children? Are they involved with journalism or politics? Well, um, in, in, in various ways, um, my son, uh, for instance, was the budget director of the state of North Carolina for a couple of years. He never ran for public office, but he did serve in pub appointed public office. Um, he's also on the Board of Governors of the University of North Carolina um, and teaches uh, uh, at the uh, Duke uh, Graduate School. So like Koki, he's, he's found a, a way to contribute to public service, not in elective office, but in these other, these other jobs. Um, and um, Becca, who you uh, all heard from, um, has written three books and is working on a fourth. Um, and so she is uh, continuing the tradition in terms of being an author uh, like her mother. Um, my son's wife, uh, my daughter-in-law has a new book coming out next summer on the artists of North Carolina. So one form or another, uh, uh, there are a lot of people in the family who are carrying on in one form or another, either public service or, or, or writing or both. Um, uh, and, uh, but so far we haven't had anybody actually run for office in the next generation, but we'll, we'll see if that happens. Huh. Well, sounds like the family is definitely carrying on, certainly in your footsteps and Koki's, so that's lovely. Um, if there are no more questions, I know this is only one of Stephen's appearances tonight, so we want to give him time to catch his breath in the meantime. Um, Gail, again, I thank you, and Emily for arranging our CCC program. We thank all of you for joining us this evening. We hope you've enjoyed the program. This is our last CCC program of the year, but we'll invite you back next year, and um, please stay informed, visit our website, um, catch up on our email blast, and Stephen, thank you so much. This was really a fabulous presentation. Well, thank you for having me, and let me say one final thing that um, uh, Hanukkah is over, but Christmas is coming. And um, if anybody who's listening, because we're, we didn't do this in person, and, and often when I do it in person, I'm able to personalize and uh, assign books. But um, if anybody uh, would like a, a book plate, uh, a signed book plate, um, email Len and, uh, with your address. And I'm more than happy to just, and, and tell me how you want it made out. And if you want to give the book as a gift, uh, one of the things that I've learned, um, this was true of Koki's books for years, but it's been true of this book too. A high percentage of the people who buy this book are women buying it for other women. And when I make these books out, it says, make it out to my mother, make it out to my niece, make it out to my friend, make it out to my goddaughter. So it's, I'm sorry we weren't able to gather in person, but um, if, if for any reason anybody would like uh, uh, to give this as a gift and wants a, a signed copy, a personalized copy, please let uh, uh, you take care of this, Lynn, and, and, and let people know, and, and just send me a list of people if anybody is interested, and I'm happy to 
send them send it out to them. Okay. I'm happy to do that. And um, even though today's the last day of Hanukkah, I can tell you my kids never mind delayed gifts. So uh, it's not too <laughs> late for those celebrating Hanukkah to also buy gifts. So thank you all. And please email me if you'd like a signed book plate and I will take care of the logistics and getting the information. To thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was really an excellent program. Well, good night. Thanks. Thanks good night, all. Happy holidays. Good night. Good night.